Tēnā koutou katoa, te upoku o Ika te Amaui, ahau. Uh, no te Papa Tangarewa, ahau, ko Mike Haim, ahau. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Haim. I am the Lead UX Designer at Te Papa Tongarewa, the Museum of New Zealand down in Wellington. It's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And I know we're sort of, you know, hanging out for that afternoon tea, but I do hope that you would just, just keep focused for that just that little bit longer. Now I want to start off with a, um, a really important question. And that question is, should I wear togs? <laughs> should I wear togs? Yes. Right? I now realise now that I say this, you're probably like trying to check me out. So, are you the right person? Which I'm not asking about physique. Let's keep going. What I'm saying is, well, okay, give me some more information. At a tropical beach, ah, oh, yeah, okay, yes. In a tropical beach, yes, you should wear togs. But what about this beach? Whew. No, not at this beach. I guess you know. If I'm asking, should I wear togs? No. What about here at a place like this? You know that feeling of being underdressed, and it's like painfully awkward and you realize as soon as you walk in you're like whoopsie you know, this this is the wrong event so togs at this um, this place no at this party no what about at this party oh yeah pool party can't say I've ever been to a pool party but you know I think togs are appropriate here and so when we go back to that question should I wear togs how do you answer that the only real answer to the question should I wear togs if that's all you're, you're asked is it depends and it depends on the context. Um, so I think that's true of most things. Whether you're trying to work out if togs are appropriate or if your digital experience is a good fit, you need to understand the context in which you're operating. The title of my talk today is Context is Queen, riffing off the idea of content is king. And the subtitle is And Museums Are Weird. So context, what am I talking about? Well, I think if we're asking the question of who, we're talking about our users. We kind of get that right. Um, in my case, um, I, I work both in the uh, digital sort of the online space, so websites, but also the digital interactives within the museum. So the users to me are not just users, but visitors. If we're asking what, we're talking about our content. And thank goodness we've you know, got a content strategy sort of industry is um, exploding right now, and that's so great. We're all aware of the importance of designing for our content. But if we're asking where, when, why, how, and what, we're starting to talk about context. And what I want to impress upon you guys today is asking these other questions is really vital. And it's really vital in the museum space. Some of you might prefer a visual. So here's our users trapped in a bubble. Um, and here's the content. Here's hoping we can ma make those match and fit and overlap. And this is the context. So context is the situation in which your users are interacting with your content. Ta-da, yay. <laughs> and museums are weird. They are a weird place to work. So I've been at Te Papa for, for one year. Um, the UX team has only been a permanent thing for eight months. Um, I work with Kate Wanless, who used to work at Digital Art Network, um, and Karen Bryce. Um, and so we make this team of three, and we've been there for eight months. So it's, we're, we're starting out. And the digital team at Te Papa is growing. The three of us um, in the UX team come from digital agencies. And so becoming in-house in a museum, it's been a shock. Uh, museums are great. Uh, as I was introduced before, you know, I'll discuss things like 19th century portraiture, whakapapa, volcanoes, colonization, and that's just in the morning. Um, so the content we work with is rich, and the scale at which we're working is, is excellent. We have, uh, last year, almost 1.6 million visitors in a year. So we're working on a, on a prominent, in a prominent place. But doing UX in a museum is also really challenging. It's not as simple as simply lifting and shifting some of the methodologies and ways that we've worked in the past, and I'll explain why. So starting with one of those questions, where? Now obviously in my context I can say where quite specifically about a location, but I think keep that loose in your mind about thinking about where are your visitors meeting up with your content, or your, sorry, where are your users matching up with your content. So for me, um, it's obviously in that physical space, the physical location. And I think in the digital industry, we often have this idea of the superiority of digital. We have phrases like digital transformation, technological advance. We think of companies like Netflix, Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, and we sort of know those places, those companies have transformed their industries, right? We're used to that idea of digital disruption. 
Um, and they do that by creating a superior user experience. I mean, who remembers going to Blockbuster and their DVD was sort of already rented out and because it was so popular. So you had to find a second DVD instead and you got home and that was scratched. You know, oh no, you know, disappointment to the, to the max. So we're used to digital, seeing digital as like it's transforming and improving and changing and, uh, and saving our world in some ways. But even though we see implicitly that digital is superior, in the museum this is not necessarily the same. This is not necessarily the case. So let me explain. Think about the Mona Lisa. We can all picture it. Uh, I read about how in the 1960s it was valued by an insurance company at about $100 million US. And in today's dollars, that would be about $700 million US, by far and away the most highly valued artwork in the world. And this is the gallery in which you see it. It's the painting in the center of the room. Um, it's ke you're kept at bay by like some bollards, and it's behind bulletproof glass, and it's visited by six million people a year. More than our entire population in New Zealand goes to visit this room to see that painting a year. Um, I do feel sorry for the paintings on the side of the room. They look a little bit neglected. <laughs> now, here's, a, here's the Mona Lisa as well. Um, I found this in about, after about five seconds of Googling um, online on Wikimedia Commons. Um, a really high-res image. It's, it's much, you know, the projector's okay, but on a retina screen, it's really beautiful. You can see the texture and the detail in the painting, and the colour's just lovely. So I want to think about, do a little thought experiment. Let's pretend we're UXs in the Louvre in Paris, and we're trying to alleviate congestion in, the, in that cramped gallery. So say we're going to take that digitised artwork, and we're going to put it onto screens um, in the foyer. Not just one screen, but let's say we can, we can afford 12, 24 screens, and we can give visitors lots of access so they can pinch and zoom and get right up into the detail, and that way fewer people might go to the gallery so we can ease the congestion. Now, with my entire year of, ex uh, year, year of experience at the museum, I'm going to say that's not going to do jack. What do you guys think? Agree. You can see that, right? Um, and I'm going to explain why. This is a quote taken from um, some research from a company called Morris Hargreaves McIntyre, speaking with a participant about digital. This person said, I used to think the exact opposite that there should be touch screens at every corner so you can always get the information. Now I'd be more inclined to leave all that out so you just focus on the artwork itself. There's a concept that we talk about called the aura of the object. It comes from a, um, a man called Walter Benjamin and he speaks about how objects have this inherent exclusive aura that can't just be transposed to reproductions. If I was to take that Mona Lisa, the digitized version, and get it printed down at the warehouse stationery on canvas, do you think I could get anywhere near $700 million US? What if I was a painter, you know, a master painter, and I could replicate da Vinci's strokes? Could I get anywhere near, near $700 million? No. Because when people want to see the Mona Lisa, they want to see the Mona Lisa. They're after the physical experience, the physical object, the physicality, the aura of the object, and that can't be transposed to anything digital. Another way of thinking about this is live music. We all have our favourite artists and bands that we love. We have their music, their content on our phones, on our, on our devices. But when they come to town, we still shell out more money to go see them. Because what we're after is that physical, immersive, atmospheric experience. Not necessarily their content, their music. It's about that physicality. You guys following? Cool. Another quote um, from another participant in that same research study. One of my favourite things about places like Te Papa is the art, and I'd like that to be as physical as possible. I think digital gadgets can distract from that. So that's the context in which our digital team works, <laughs> often uphill. It's not, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, but there's definitely sometimes some pushback in terms of how do we create meaningful digital interactions when people are often actually after physical interactions, which is sort of weird for us, right? It's sort of jarring, because we just assume digital is often the superior way of doing things, but maybe it's not always. So what do we do? So we do what only digital can do. Um, so there's a few ways that I think we can do this, and I'm going to speak to one of those examples, and that is to augment the physical objects. 
So I'm referencing um, an exhibit in Gallipoli, which is this fantastic exhibition at Te Paparan at the moment. Um, I wasn't part of that, but my colleagues Prue and Amos were digital producers. I'll be speaking about their work. And so there's this one exhibit in Gallipoli, and it has four objects of actual ammunition taken from World War I. Sort of rifle bullets, um, and a, an artillery shell exploding, and a grenade. And it's quite gruesome to see these real pieces of ammunition, 100 years old. Some of those bullets have actually been fired and collected from you know, different places. And so it's, it's chilling and it's visceral and it's, you know, it's uncomfortable. And next to that um, display, there's, there are buttons and you can push on one um, next to each piece of ammunition and it, and it lights up the case red and st it starts to glow red. And on a screen, um, you know, life-size, human-size screen next to it, we see the CGI skeleton be impacted in slow motion by that, those, that ammunition. And then we read a, read a case study that talks about how that would have been described if you've ever looked up your, um, you know, your ancestors, kind of what they might have, uh, how they might have been impacted by the war, and we see some of that case study written up. And so what that does is the digital is augmenting and bringing to life those objects, those physical objects, not surpassing, not reproducing, not over, overpowering, but augmenting and supporting the physical object um, rather than yeah, replacing it like we're used to doing. So a bit of a summary. When we're thinking about where in the museum, we really need to make sure we don't assume that digital experiences are superior. All right. So another question we ask a lot is who are our visitors with? This is a really, really key one for us. Uh, so this is, I'm referencing a study um, from a company called Impax. Um, it's a US research organization that's um, surveyed sort of thousands of people, and they put this question uh, to them. What's the best thing about a visit to a cultural organization? Uh, and these were the results. Number one was time, in, uh, time with family and friends. By more than double, this scored um, you know, significantly higher than the second, which was seeing or interacting with the exhibits or the performances themselves. So uh, Colleen Dillon Schneider puts it like this, with is greater than what, which is pretty challenging. Oops, with, oops. Mm. with is greater than what. She, uh, and she wrote about this as well, cultural institutions are facilitators of shared experiences. So often we sort of wrapped up in our content as that our content is just the focus, but we actually have to be thinking about the experiences people are having with the people around them not just with us and our content and our stories. And this is significant to Te Papa because over 80% of our visitors visit with another person. So we are super, super aware of the experience people have with each other, not just with us and our content, but with each other. Again, a different participant in that same research from before, apps. I'm emphatically against it. People on their smartphones, getting in everybody else's way, you zone out of everybody else around you. And we kind of know that instinctively, don't we? We've all been to a cafe with a friend and, and you're, you know, you're, you're mid-sentence pouring your heart out and then, oop, they get a notification. And then, you know, they look up and they go, hmm. And it's just so cutting and so rude because they're totally removed from that social context that you're in with them. You might think, hey, what about social media? What about texting and phone calls? You know, digital, these, these, um, these devices, they connect us, but they don't connect us with the people around us particularly well. Digital can be so captivating and so immersive, but it's also often created for one-to-one -one relationships. One user, one device. One mouse, one keypad, one handheld smartphone. And so what they do is they suck us in. They pull us in. And this is this beautiful image that's been made for my presentation. Thank you, Anton Giga from Paris. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me using his image. Um, but this, I mean, I'll just leave that there, really. And that's what we don't want to do. That's what we can't do in the museum. If we understand that 80% of people are coming with other people and that with is often greater than what, we're paying such a close attention to the social context. So what do we do with that? Any ideas? Hmm. We don't neglect the group, that's for one. Imagine six dots have come to visit the, the museum and they're interacting with a hexagonal sort of interactive. 
what we don't want to be doing is focusing on this, getting information out of our device to the person. That's one thing to do, but it's more than just an interaction between a device and an individual. What we're aiming for is this, where we create interaction within a group, facilitated by our digital. How the fuck do you do that? <laughs> um, so focus on the interaction between members of the group. Well, I've got one example, which is uh, we're working on at the moment, uh, which is possibly going to be doing that. So this is um, Art Wall, or Patu Toy, and um, it's going to be released to the museum imminently. Um, and it's began from a design sprint, we had some ideas, we put them on paper, we went out to, our, uh, to the visitors on the floor. Just a little side note, how jealous are you of me and my UX team that we can just go through the door and there are our users. <laughs> Kate Wanless, our UX researcher, just loves that. She's so excited. Um, so this, this came from a design sprint, we took some ideas out on paper, I had this idea called Tinder for Art, thought it was going to be awesome, was not, it was terrible. <laughs> I thought it was going to be really good, honestly. I thought, you know, it's going to really help people like, engage and evaluate art. And they're like, nah. So we, um, we stripped it back and we had, um, it sort of turned into this, um, where it's really simple. You just scan through hundreds of artworks that we have. And then when you, you find one that you like, you can project it up onto the wall. And when it's fully installed, it will be projected, say, five or six meters high. And you get to add your name and a comment, if you like. And it's just sort of like sharing a little bit of yourself with people passing by at the same time as you know, getting to enjoy our art. It's also going to be av made available on a, on a device, you know, um, which a ch is challenging, but we think it's the right call. And this is a photo taken from prototype testing, where we, um, we turned it into like, um, a little digital prototype, put it on a tablet device, and then we, we installed it in one of the galleries before the galleries were closed for construction um, in February. And Kate ran these sort of observation sessions and this was our favourite moment, where this group of five French students um, were animatedly passing the tablet back and forward and kind of pointing to the screen and, and you know, like all in their excited French. And um, this just makes it so much cooler. Um, and, and the way Kate describes it is, is the tech just sort of disappeared. It was the art, it was the conversation, it was the debate, and the tech was just sort of being passed around as a controller. And it was no longer the focus of, you know, which is what we don't want to do. Um, we saw a father and his two kids sit down in a beanbag, bunker down, and they spent a good 10 minutes choosing like 20 works, you know, and it was no longer this sort of exclusive one-to-one -one, um, thing, but something far more social. Something else we're looking into is digital touch tables. Um, so this is a prototype um, that we're going to be taking out, wheeling out onto the floor next week or maybe the week after just as a really early idea of explore, exploring how we might use this. We have um, a woman called Hazel Bradshaw um, uh, running several different prototypes on how we might use these in the museum. And so these tables are sort of, you know, yay big, they're quite, they're quite large, and they can accept 80 points of touch, meaning eight pairs of hands can operate this all, and those, all of those 80 fingers are registered by the table. And because six to eight people can stand around it, no one person is in control. There's no start button or no home, I mean, you can design what you like on it, but there's no sort of controller. Everyone is in control. And it's almost like these tables in front of you where, you know, anyone can draw on them. And so everyone can play with them. Everyone's sort of the master of them. And so we're exploring how we might use those, um, and it's quite exciting. So when we're thinking about with, we have to make sure, you know, we focus, we be mindful of the group because we know that digital can focus too much on the individual. All right, finally, um, why? Why are our visitors here? Now, this is a rather big topic. I'll just be sort of skimming this as a, as, to give you an overview. Um, but imagine, with this, imagine this text conversation with me. What should we do today? Oh, here's this, here's this, uh, this good war exhibition on it to Papa. Uh, yeah. It's free. I've heard it's amazing. Mm, we could swing past Mojo on the way. OK, I'm in. Pick me up in 10. Pick me up in 10. <laughs> And like, you know, it sounds rather glib, but that can be a reason why people come to the museum. The motivations for visiting the museum vary. It's just been the school holidays, the weather has been terrible in Wellington, we find lots of kids there because the parents are like, get out of the house. Um, we're routinely listed as one of the top 10 uh, tourist destinations, so we have just tourists coming to tick a box. Um, you know, that's not to say that's a bad thing, 
but it's not always motivated by an interest in our content or a focus on our content. There's lots of other motivations going on. So what's it like walking into a museum for the first time? I did this yesterday. I visited this fine establishment in this lovely city of yours. Um, I've never been. And what's it like? It's a great museum. It's got a lot of stuff in there. And the experience is kind of like walking in going, whoa, whoa, so much here. What's this? Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's boring. Oh, you know. And it's sort of this weird experience of just walking into a room and it's like, oh, this one's full of Asian jars. <laughs> this one's full of um, war mem memorabilia. It's, you don't really know where you're going often. It's just um, you're browsing and trawling. It's you know, not everyone's experience, but many people's. It's like cherry picking experiences, what, what things glint and catch your eye. Um, I think of it almost like trawling social media. When you open up social media, you're not like going for a destination. The destination is the trawl, <laughs> is the browse. It's like, oh, baby pick, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, food, someone's meal, oh, yeah, rant about Donald Trump, rant about anti vaxxers oh, dear. <laughs> You know, like, it's sort of just, there's no key destination. It's simply trawling and browsing and looking for inspiration. So how do you design for that? If, that, if that's not very clear, let's talk about mortgage calculators. Sorry, probably a faux pas to do this in Auckland. But it's um, a good example. Um, um, when I used to work in a digital um, agency, Springload, um, I helped build these calculators. I was a front-end dev, part of a small team. Um, and I've also been using these recently, and my wife and I, we've just purchased our first home. So using these calculators, I don't use those to browse the numbers. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder what happens if I put this one in. I'm finding out specific answers to specific questions to help me with a really strong intrinsic motivation to buy a house. You know, how much can we afford? What are my repayments going to be? What should I put an offer in? What happens if the interest rates go up? I'm really seeking out information, and I'm using these for a task. I'm not browsing. So in the UX team, we're often talking about this continuum of browsing versus seeking, making sure that we understand different motivations to approach our content. Are they seeking us out? Are they seeking this experience? Or are they browsing? And if they're browsing, how much more do we have to sort of entice and invite? You don't really have to entice people to your mortgage calculators, because if they don't want them, they don't want them. <laughs> Um, but if it's browsing sort of content, you need to make sure that you're sort of creating that whole user journey, not just focusing on that content. So, sorry, my summary's a bit lame here. Be mindful of the browsing mentality. <laughs> um, and so one of the ways this works out, um, to make that a bit clearer, is the way that we do user testing. So user testing is good, but, ooh, what, what's this but? Um, we have to do a little bit more than just user testing. If we come up with a new sort of prototype or a new interactive, um, we, we might show that to someone on, on the floor, a willing visitor. And what, what's that person going to do? They're going to read every line. <laughs> and then they're going to go to the next page and read every line. And then what do we see when we go to the museum? Bounce, 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 bounce. People browsing, people just, uh, you know, trawling. And that, that's fine. That's how they're going. Um, so we're, we're making sure that we're doing things like observations, uh, intercept surveys, analytics, to see how our content's really performing in the wild, not simply just testing the mechanics. And we just had a, a workshop on that um, before with Dan. So the idea of not just testing the functionality of things, but testing the concepts and the content. Um, with, we're exploring bring your own device as well, which we know is you know, tricky with, to do with social. Um, but the reason we're doing this is to uh, make sure that we, um, uh, you know, making the most of uh, what people have in their phones, oh, sorry, in their pockets, the devices they have in their pockets. But what happens if you take exhibition content and you put it on the internet for people to access on their own phones in the museum? Well, it's invisible. Oops, that was, I didn't have a little, uh, I'm supposed to have a little thing that says invisible. Um, there you go. <laughs> um, so when, when we work with, if we, making content for people's own devices, which is something that's really um, exciting for the museum sector, um, we have to make sure we think about that whole user journey. How do we get people to that content if it's invisible to them? Um, I'll skim through this example. So when we're thinking about why, 
make sure you, we don't, don't neglect your user journey mapping. And there was just a workshop on that as well. Excellent. Understand why your users are here. What, what has brought them together with your content? What has brought them to you? What were they really searching for? So, to conclude, museums are weird. They put a really strong emphasis on the physical and social environments, which digital is often in contention with. Museums are also filled with visitors who are browsing for content with no clear goals. They're not looking for a destination necessarily, they're simply seeing what catches their eye. So we can't just lift and shift solutions that work in other industries, but we need to make sure that it works in our context. We understand that user testing has its limits, so we need to make sure we really test the content and the concepts. And so in my job, I'm not just asking who and what, but where, when, why, how and with. Is it on a touchscreen? Is it on a kiosk? Is it on people's own devices? And how's that going to affect the experience? Is it on unusual, unfamiliar technology like AR or VR or digital touch tables? And how do we help coach people who approach this technology for the first time and have to engage with it or we've lost them? Um, and where is it? Is it in a quiet, hushed gallery? And if I press the play button, is it going to make loud noises and, and disrupt this hushed gallery? Oh, I'm not going to use it. So where things are placed within the museum can affect their success as well. Is it in a threshold space or a, a movement space where people are moving from one place to the other and therefore we're not going to be able to stop them in their tracks? Um, and why are people here? Have they paid for this exhibition? Because if they've paid, they're probably looking to get the most out of it and are going to be a little bit more determined to try all the things. But if it's free, they might just be bouncing from level to level. So museums are weird. And context is queen. Understanding your user's context is imperative. Context gives us the parameters with which to know if our thing is a success, and whether it's appropriate to wear togs. You know, togs on a beach, yes, good, but togs on a pol uh, in an Arctic beach, not good. Togs, but that's not all. What about togs on a tropical beach at a wedding? Ooh, no longer good, you know, no longer right, no longer appropriate. But togs, <laughs> but togs on a beach at Dan's wedding, different, right? Because we've all got a friend like Dan, and Dan's totally fine with it. Dan's totally okay with it. He probably is wearing togs himself. So keep asking those questions. Keep understanding the context within which your, your users are meeting your content. So to understand your users and to understand how your content fits in their lives, you must understand their context. Context is queen, and museums are fucking weird. Namahinui. Thanks. <laughs>